Hello, and welcome to my channel. Okay, alright. Let's start the music. Hello, welcome to my channel. I'm Vivi Kachi, and today I am crocheting while I read a classic grim fairy tale, The Six Soldiers of Fortune. Now, this version was translated by Lucy Crane and was published by Wordsworth Editions. So we will shall start from the beginning. There once was a man who was a jack of all trades. He had served in the war and had been brave and bold, but at the end of it he was sent to his business with three farthings and his discharge. I am not going to stand this, the soldier The soldier said. Wait till I find the right man to help me, and the king shall give me all the treasures of his kingdom before he has done with me. Then, full of wrath, he went into the forest. He saw one standing there by six trees, which had been rooted up as if they had been stalks of corn. And he said to him, Will you be my man and come along with me? All right, answered he. I must take this bit of wood home to my father and mother. And taking one of the trees, he bound it to the other five. And pulling the bundle on his shoulder, he carried it off. And then soon coming back, he went along with his leader and um, he, who said, Two such as we stand against the whole world. When they had gone on a little while, they came to a huntsman who was kneeling on one knee and taking careful aim with his rifle. Huntsman, said the leader, what are you aiming at? Two miles from here, answered he, sits a fly on a bough of an oak tree. I meant to put a bullet into its left eye. Oh, come along with me, said the leader. Three of us together can stand against the world. The huntsman was quite willing to go with them, and so they went on until they came to seven windmills, whose sails were going around briskly, yet there was no wind blowing from any quarter, not a leaf stirred. Well, said the leader, I cannot think what ails the windmills, turning without wind. He went on with his followers about two miles further, then they came upon a man sitting in a tree holding one nostril and blowing with the other. Now then, said the leader, what are you doing up there? Two miles from here, said he, there are seven windmills. I am blowing, and they are going round. Oh, go with me, cried the leader. Four of us can stand against the world. So the blower got down and went with him. After a time, they came to a man standing on one leg, and the other had been taken off and was lying near him. You seem to have gotten a handy way of resting yourself, said the leader to the man. I am a runner, answered he, and in order to keep myself from going too fast, I have taken off a leg, for when I run with both, I go faster than a bird with can fly. Oh, go with me. The five of us together may stand against the world. So he went with them all together, and it was not long before they met a man with a little hat, and he wore it just over one ear. Manners, manners, said the leader. With your hat like that, you must look like a jack fool. Sorry. I dare not put it straight, answered the other, for if I did, there would be such a terrible frost that... The very birds would be frozen and fall dead from the sky to the ground. Oh, come with me. 
we six together may well stand against the whole world, said the leader. So the six went on until they came to a town where the king had caused it to be made known that whoever would run a race with his daughter and win it might become her husband, but that whoever lost must lose his head to the bargain. The leader came forward and said one of his men should run for him. Then, said the king, his life too must be put in the pledge, and if he fails, his head and yours too must fall. When his quite settled, and when this was quite settled and agreed upon, the leader called the runner and strapped his second leg onto him. Now look out, said he, take care that we win. It had been agreed that the one who should bring water first from a far distant brook should be accounted winner. Now the king's daughter and the runner each took a pitcher, and they started at the same time. But in one moment, when the king's daughter had gone but a little way, the runner was out of sight, for his, for his running was if the wind had rushed by. In a short time he reached the brook, filling his pitcher full of water, and turned back again. About halfway home, however, he was overcome with weariness, setting down his pitcher. He lay down on the ground in order to go to sleep, but in order to waken soon again by not lying too soft, he had taken a horse's skull which lay, which lay near and placed it under his head for a pillow. In the meantime, the king's daughter, who was a good runner and enough to beat an ordinary man, had reached the brook, filled her pitcher, and was hastening it back, hastening with it back again. When she saw the runner lying asleep, the day is mine," said she with much joy, and she emptied out his pitcher and hastened on. Now all had been lost, but for the huntsman who was standing on the castle wall, with his keen eyes he saw all that happened. We must not be outdone by the king's daughter, said he, and he loaded his wife a rifle and took so good an aim that he shot the horse's skull from under the rider's head, or the runner's head, um, without him doing any harm. And the rider woke and jumped up, he saw his pitcher standing empty and the king's daughter far on her way home. But not losing courage, he ran swiftly to the brook, filled it again with water, for, and for all that, he got home ten minutes before the king's daughter. Look you, said he, this is the first time I have really stretched my legs, before it was not worth the name of running. The king was vexed, and the daughter yet more so that she should be beaten by a discharged common soldier. And, and they took counsel together on how they might rid themselves of him and his companions at the same time. I have a plan, said the king. Do not fear that we should, and that we shall be quit of them forever. Then he went out to the men and bade them to feast and be merry, eat and drink, and led them into a room, which had a floor of iron. The doors were iron, and the windows in, had iron frames and bolts, and in the room was a table set out with costly food. Now go in there and make yourselves comfortable said the king, and when they had gone in, he had locked the door behind them and bolted it. Then he called the cook and told him to make a big fire underneath the room so that the iron floor of it should be red hot. And the cook did so, and the six men began to feel the room growing very warm 
by reason, as they thought at first, of the good dinner. But as the heat grew greater and greater, they began to think it was an evil king's plan to suffocate them. He shall not succeed, however, said the man with the little hat. I will bring on the frost that shall make the fire feel ashamed of itself and creep out of the way. So he set his little hat straight on his head, and immediately there came such a frost that the heat passed away and the food froze in the dishes. After an hour or two had passed, the king had thought that they must have perished in the heat, and he caused for the door to be opened, went himself to see how they fared. And when the door flew back, they were all quite safe and sound and they said that they were quite ready to come out so that they might warm themselves but the great cold of the room had caused the food to freeze in the dishes full of wrath the king went to the cook and scolded him and asked why he had not done as he was ordered it is hot enough in there you may see yourself said the cook the king looked and saw an immense fire burning underneath the room of iron and began to think that the six men were not to be rid of in that way. And he thought of a new plan by which it might be managed. So he sent for the leader and said to him, If you will give up your right to my daughter and take gold instead, you may have as much as you like. Certainly, my lord king, answered the man. Let me have as much gold as my servant can carry, and I will give up all claim to your daughter. And the king agreed that he should come again in a fortnight to fetch the gold. The man then called together all the tailors in the kingdom and set them to work to make a sack. And it took them a fortnight. And when it was ready, the strong man who had been found rooting up trees took it on his shoulder, and went to the king. Who is this immense fellow carrying on his shoulder a bundle of stuff as big as a house? said the king, terrified to think of how much gold he would carry off, and a ton of gold was dragged by the sixteen strong men. But he put it all into the sack with one hand, saying, Why don't you bring me some more? This hardly covers the bottom. So the king bade them fetch by degrees the whole of his treasure, and then the sack was not even half full. Bring more, cried the man. These few scraps go no way at all. Then at last, at seven thousand wages laden with then at last, seven thousand wagons, laden with gold, collected through the kingdom, were driven up, and he drew them in his sack, oxen and all. I will not look too closely, said he, but, but take what I can get, so long as the sack is full. And then, and when it was all put in there, there was still plenty of room. I must make a end of this, he said. If it is not full, it is so much easier to tie up. He hoisted it on his back and went off with his comrades. When the, sing <clears throat> when the king saw all the wealth of his realm carried off by a single man, he was full of wrath. And he bade his cavalry mount and went off with his comrades. When the king saw... Oh, um, sorry. He bade his cavalry mount and followed after the six men and, and take the sack away from the strong man. Two regiments were soon upon them and called to them to consider themselves prisoners, and to deliver up the sack or be cut into pieces. Prisoners, say you, said the man who could blow. Suppose you first have a little dance together in the air. 
Holding one nostril, blowing through the other, he sent the regiments flying over, head over heels, over hills and far away. But a segment, <clears throat> but a sergeant, who had nine wounds and was a brave fellow, begged not to be put to so much shame. The blower let him down easy, so that he came to no harm, and he bade himself, and, and he bade him to go tell the team, bade him go to the king and tell him whatever regiments he liked to send more should be blown away just the same and the king when he got the message said let the followers uh, let the fellows be they have some right on their side so the six comrades carried home the treasure divided it among them and lived contented contented until they died. Now, I would like to apologize for any and all stammering. It is something that I am working on. Um, I hope that you had enjoyed this reading and found it somewhat soothing. If you have any suggestions or um, any uh, constructive criticism, don't hesitate to comment at the bottom of this video. And also, um, please subscribe if you wish to see more. And if um, you enjoyed this video, maybe share with your friends. Thank you, and I hope you'll be able to see the next video. Bye!